Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running and nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, how you doing? Thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you for checking out our program. Hopefully, you are having a great day. You are ready for the weekend. You are ready to, I don't know, do something fun, have some fun, and of course, ready for some Computer America, because we are going to help you out of the end of your workday. And you know, hey, we have a great show planned for you, where we have none other than Ralph Bond himself joining us to talk all about the latest science and tech trends, lots of different stories, lots of great articles, and hey, it's going to be a lot of fun. So everyone, sit back, relax, and before we get started, first things first, ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you'll find everything, including the show notes. After the program, we're going to go ahead and put those up, and you can find everything, including a link to our guest website, uh, any articles that we cover, anything and everything will be right there. Uh, It's a vital part of our show, and of course, everything else that we do here at Computer America can be found at our website. So, with that being said, everyone, I hope you're having a great day once again, and you are ready for today's program. Let's go ahead and get started and bring on our guest. And he's waiting oh so patiently in the wings once again, as always. Ralph Bond, he is longtime Computer America correspondent, longtime friend of the show, and used to work with Intel, used to work with Autodesk, and of course, you know, uh, semi retired now, has a lot on his plate still. And of course, he does a monthly segment here where we focus on just the latest in, as I said before, science and tech trends. And hey, we appreciate every moment. Ralph, how you doing? Welcome onto the program. <laughs> I'm doing great, and I, I told you in the chat before we got on air, everybody, we're having some kind of major thunderstorm yeah. cell moving into our area, although I haven't heard any thunder now in the last few minutes, but I just wanted to make a, a public service announcement that if I suddenly disappear, you'll know why. <laughs> I'll understand. When we'll but be... I think we're going to be fine. Perfect. All right, and we're going to be ready for that, but uh, at the same time, I'm happy that uh, that you're here and able to join us. Uh, how you been? I mean, you know, hey, it's been a whole right. month. Doing great. Hey, we just finished a wonderful uh, road trip in southern British Columbia. What a beautiful part of the country. Oh, my God. It's just gorgeous up there. And it's so interesting. To, if you look at a map of British Columbia, all the population, as with much of Canada, is kind of concentrated on about a 200-mile bit from our border up to you know, about 200 miles deep. And the rest is wilderness. It's just, uh, <laughs> But it's beautiful up there. Big glaciers and rivers and streams and lakes and forests and it, and this year thank god no forest fires so hooray i've i've never had the pleasure it's definitely a trip that i hear everyone who does it is like man i'm glad that i did it um yeah check I, it out yeah definitely plan on it and hey happy that you're back and happy that you could join us it didn't interfere with our schedule at all and hey. overall <laughs> hey uh let's go ahead and get started so uh before we get started, how about you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and talk about why you uh, why you really focus on uh, science, science and you know the latest technology trends. Why, why does that appeal to you? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess it comes from my family history. My grandfather, my mother's dad, was a scientist. He was a physicist with Bell Labs and worked on the transistor with Shockley and Brandine and crew. So there was that going on in my mm-hmm. life. He lived with us when he was older and toward the end of his life, he lived with us and it was a great influence. My father was a mechanical and chemical engineer. And so I kind of grew up with Spock's all around me, <laughs> with <laughs> Mr. Spock kind of character. So I developed this love of technology, although I, my education was in the fine arts and other things like that. But I just always had this love of technology, went into tech writing very early on in the computer age when there was mini computers then led into personal computers and the rest is history work for Intel as you mentioned then my last 10 years of my career with Autodesk and here I am and if you want to learn about me it's really easy just point your browser to my name Ralph Bond and then the word Wix W-I-X and that'll bring you right up to the link to my website so that's me <laughs> perfect perfect and hey uh, so uh, for anyone out there watching the video portion we have uh, the list up there you can see right there you can see Ralph you can see myself and hey you can see all the different stories uh, and yeah. you know we I, I see that you did it again uh, last month we had a bit of a different format change it was fine but um, 
overall, we still didn't get to all the stories, which uh, which is no. fine. Hey, conversation's <laughs> great. Um, yeah. And hey, if you if we don't get any if we don't cover any of them, you can of course check this out after the show in the show notes. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Show notes are great. Be sure to get them, everybody. Absolutely. So uh, what better place to start than story number one? What is this? Well, check this out. This is from Gizmodo magazine, story by Andrew Lozeski. And the headline, IBM patents a small, or pardon me, a smartwatch that transforms into a tablet on your wrist. Hey, that's pretty intriguing. Now, again, it's just a patent at this point. But of course, here's the challenge, as the article points out, how can you get more information on a tiny smartwatch screen, right? Well, you can increase pixel density, but let's face it, when you're looking at a tiny little wrist display, how much can you really discern with the human eye? Or you can go for a fold-out or foldable screen, uh, very much like what Samsung's been trying to do with their uh, foldable uh, phone, right? So that's your choice. So IBM has patented an idea to, for just that, a fold-out screen, for wrist wearables, which they call variable display size for an electronic display device. The problem though, the rollout of devices with folding OLED screens hasn't been very smooth. You mentioned Samsung, they've had their ups and downs with what their effort is, but eventually they're gonna work it all out. And that'll be with us. Uh, but the technology does work and it won't take long for the technology to improve, the article says. And then last it says, the patents illustrations detail a smartwatch-like device with a bezel-free screen capable of displaying some basic info information like time, weather, and a few shortcuts to other apps. And again, the illustration in the show notes from the patent filing gives you some sense of what they're up to. And I would presume, Ben, the vertical uh, lines there, the four quadrants, would suggest maybe those are the folds of the fold-out. I'm not quite sure, but it's pretty intriguing. And, you know, we'll see if IBM can pull this off. Kudos to them. Ben, are you there? Sorry about that. Uh, hey, mute switch. Oh, it's it's very, it's very hard to manage the mute switch. But hey, uh, no yeah, worries, the, the the forward from folds looks like it's going to fold out multiple times, which yeah. is different than Samsung's foldable phone, which folds yeah. once along a once, single crease. Yeah. Um, that would be different. But so here's the problem I've had, or at least we've seen with uh, some of the other uh, foldable devices and wrist. You know, right. wrist, it's, it's like real estate is sure at a premium that's guaranteed but the problem is do people really want um as much real estate as they have on a tablet or a phone on their wrist because a lot of people are carrying around their phones in their pocket anyways um do they exactly. really want a second phone on their wrist or are they ready to completely abandon their phone in favor of only having something on their wrist i mean uh exactly i, I I think a, a big problem is finding the usefulness of these devices. And Ralph, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, have you ever used a smartwatch? Yes, I have. I don't own one personally, but my daughter does. She has mm -hmm. an Apple smartwatch, and I played around with that, and it's pretty intriguing. And I've seen earlier generations as well. But going back to your point about is this really something people need or want, I don't think normal consumers, someone like me, I've got my iPhone on me all the time, yeah. right? And so if I, I think for normal users, it might be a hierarchy. So my smartwatch would give me a small amount of information. If I need more, I just reach in my pocket, go for my smartphone. And if I need even more, I get into my office if I'm accessible to it or my tablet and get onto something bigger. So I see it as a staircasing hierarchy of communication or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But, but time out, something like this idea for mm -hmm. emergency response people or maybe a quarterback on a football team, <laughs> right? You know, mm. you see the thing on their wrist. Well, wouldn't it be cool if you had a foldable thing or something that would, you know, the coach could communicate plays. And I, I don't know. I think, again, for special needs where reaching for a phone or a tablet's not going to be part of the equation, a larger, more flexible, fold-outable wrist display, maybe that makes sense. Maybe. What if you had a newspaper uh, type device, but it would fold out to the size of a newspaper, yeah. and hey, you could read it just like a newspaper, but it would change display. Like you, you, you wouldn't. 
Obviously, you wouldn't throw away the device, but uh, it would be very thin. It'd be flexible. It'd fold out to have a lot of screen space. Like, uh, you know, obviously the patent here is for a wristwatch to turn into something that would be, looks to be, you know, four by six inch, uh, you know, a decent size uh, small tablet. But what if you just expanded the, the technology of the device into something that is massive and has like, I don't know, a, a different form factor, because right now it seems like we're trying to turn the smartwatch into a small tablet, which we have both of those. We have a smartwatch and right. we have small tablets. Right. Uh, where does this technology fit in to, or how does this technology enables, enable us to do something that hasn't been done before in right. terms of right. display? But you know how technology goes, Then They will find a way. Yeah, like very it, true. Very true. And you bring them to the football field, they're going to figure out how to play. It's, it's all the case of finding a a right niche for this, whether this is a mass consumer appeal thing, I, I'm with you. I question that, but for specialty purposes, it could be a really cool thing. I and and I'm actually pretty interested to see if they can up the flexibility of traditional screens, where mm. um, you know, obviously, if you can have this this kind of glass and this surface uh, fold and bend, uh, traditional phones and traditional, uh, or I should say, traditional smartphones, traditional smartphones and tablets and things like that. Hopefully, they get a lot more flexible too. I I yeah. would love to see a day when all technology is flexible is, is shatterproof <laughs> and bend proof and that kind of thing uh that that's going to be a dream come true too agree agree and then you can work on my lower back can we get that flexible <laughs> too? that'd be really awesome we can't make everything bend but we can try our best so <laughs> there you go and and by the way and actually i'm just realizing with uh, with this diagram here it doesn't just fold out four times it actually looks like it folds out eight times because it uh, it folds in the middle there as well uh, so it kind of folds up and then stuff. out. So yeah, uh, that, curious. Yeah, that that'd be uh, definitely interesting. And of course, that's uh, IBM, right? Yeah, uh, IBM. Yep. Uh, patents are far are a far cry away from an actual product, but it shows where the company is thinking. So exactly. makes perfect sense. Okay, so story number one, very interesting. Story number two. Um, okay. I, I'm glad that you included this one. This is something that um, we have not talked a lot about uh, here in, on the program. So I'm glad that you wanted to highlight it. Let's go ahead, get into the article, and then we can talk about it. Yeah. So this is from CNET, uh, Oscar Gonzalez story. Uh, headline, Amazon asks the Federal Communications Committee, uh, FCC, what's the last C scan? Federal I'm Communications Commission, right. Commission, not committee, yeah. commission, to right. green light its internet satellite plan. And so I thought, well, that's kind of, you know, Amazon, they're, they're marching on a path to take over the world. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see. But so far, I think that's what's happening. Yeah, anyway, you're, and you're right in their backyard. You're going to be the first taken over. Yeah, we're, we're, we've got a huge Amazon fulfillment facility here in Hillsboro. Huge, mm. huge. <laughs> yeah, they're a big part of this community. Anyway, it says here, Amazon recently announced it's taking another step toward providing global broadband internet from space through its Project Kuiper. Now, they're not the only guys that are trying to figure out how to give the world, bathe the world with internet connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. To reach nations and environments where they're horribly underserved and to light them up, right? So this is not a unique idea, but this is Amazon's take on it. And what right. I think is fun and interesting about this one, you know, before I even say the next bullet point here, Think about how many satellites and pieces of space garbage there are floating around the <laughs> Earth right now, right? So get this. Amazon yep. filed paperwork with the U.S. government on the 4th of July, interesting, to launch 3,236 satellites needed for this plan. Let that sink in. 3,236 satellites. More stuff up there, right? The mm -hmm. satellites will orbit uh, 366 to 391 miles above the Earth. And the goal of the Kuiper system will deliver satellite broadband communication services to tens of millions of unserved and underserved consumers and businesses in the United States and around the world. Now, question I had after reading this article, I didn't find it answered in this article or others are articles I tried to dig up on this topic, and maybe you know, mm -hmm. is what download and upload speeds will be supported, okay, and what kind of a transceiver what I need in my home for my PC to uh, obviously a satellite dish kind of thing. Would it be combined with my, if I have satellite TV, could it be piggybacked on that on and on? It didn't get into that, but I thought it was an intriguing thing, especially the idea of 3000 plus satellites more in outer space. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and so for anyone out there watching the, the video portion too, I found this handy little website. It's called uh, stuff dot or stuff in dot space. <laughs> 
and uh, and it's well stuff in space, and it shows uh, you know Ralph mentioning that they want to launch another three thousand satellites. Uh, Currently, this image that we're showing on the video portion is every piece of space debris that NASA is currently tracking, and yeah, it's um mind-boggling. It's it's a lot, but at the same time, though, I, I, I mean, it's not. It's not really all that much, though. Like when you consider how big space is, I, well, I mean, um, three thousand. I think in 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 the long term is not going to be that many uh, compared to what's already out there, and compared to what space can actually hold. Uh, it will be low Earth orbit. So to answer a couple of questions, as far as I know them, um, the upload download speed. I think, uh, and this is uh, as far as I know from Starlink, which is uh, mm. Elon Musk and SpaceX's yeah, right. uh, project. Right. Uh, Starlink is essentially the same thing. They uh, they want to launch a couple thousand satellites themselves to do the exact same thing. Um, they were aiming for somewhere around 20 megabits per second up and down mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. with a reasonable latency. So it's it's not going to it's not going to replace home in a lot of places, but mm-hmm. it's going to be something. And the receiver, as far as I understand it, is going to be something similar. And I think they were approved for a bandwidth. So it's going to be something similar to uh, 4G LTE, that kind of thing. Um, OK, I get it. But it would work with your basic phone. And that's the goal is that you wouldn't need uh, a satellite. So- it would work with any handheld device, and uh, gotcha. yep, yeah. and that's why you would need thousands of satellites because you need that constant uh, signal, just you know, being beaming to your hand. And really, I love this idea, and you can look at it pessimistically or capitalistically, um, sure. where Elon Musk or Facebook or Amazon, uh, Amazon wants to make sure that you can order your uh, your laundry detergent from the middle anywhere. of the Amazon forest, uh, right? Anywhere yes. from uh, from Antarctica, <laughs> they want to make sure that you are constantly <laughs> online and ready to use their services. Uh, Facebook has a similar project that they want to work on that is very close to this, because they want you on Facebook constantly. <laughs> And not only do they want you on Facebook, but they want every, like Ralph said at the beginning, every <laughs> underserved or not yeah. served community on Earth to have access to Facebook. Um, but at the same time, think of all of the information that can spread. Think of all the people that can come online, and you know all the all of the positives that have been generated by I think over the past twenty years or something like that. An extra one point five billion people have come online thanks to smartphones and uh, places in Africa and India and China. Uh, That's led to a lot of increased commerce and a lot of uh, growth in economies, local and global. Uh, What happens when you have another six billion people come online? What happens then? Well, there could be a lot of good and I'd Mm -hmm. like to be positive, but of course, as recent events have told us with terrible bad yeah. dark side of the social media world and so forth. It could be bad too, but, but I think in the end it's net positive And I agree with you. I, I, I think it's going to be a positive when you have that many people, that many people being creative, spreading music, spreading art, spreading conversation, dialogue, and hopefully most of it good and peaceful dialogue, like you mentioned. But uh, yeah. And like these projects seem so, so strange where it's like, Oh, they want to launch thousands of satellites. Yeah. Uh, but you know, with uh, uh, let's see, it's SpaceX, of course, with Tesla. Amazon has Blue Origin, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, uh, Blue Origin. Yeah. yeah, Blue Origin, and then uh, Virgin Galactic has another one. Although I don't think they're launching satellites, I think they're working on the uh, on just everyday ordinary people going to space. But uh, the private space industry is going to make this very possible over the next ten years. So yeah, yeah. And oh, I, one last thing. Yeah. Remember, there I think it was Google. I think had an idea of very, very high altitude uh, stationary position. Balloons. Yeah, Yeah. remember that one? Yeah, so that that. was another twist on this idea. (laughs) I remember that. Although I I think this is the idea that's getting a little more traction because uh, the weather balloons were nice because you could always, uh, I guess, kind of bring them back down to Earth for repairs or replace them easily. But at the same time, you have to deal with weather conditions and you have to deal with, uh, you know, them just being in, in our atmosphere, which is a problem. So right. I think this is going to happen in the next 10 years. And Ralph, what, what's going to happen when, uh, <laughs> you know, I guess even back in my day, uh, you could say, you know, sometimes I just want to get away from it all. I want to go to a cabin somewhere with no internet <laughs> and just get away. Uh, Getting harder and harder. 10 years from now, that's not going to be possible. Your kids are always going to have access to internet uh, for oh better gosh. or for worse. 
Yeah, yeah. Yep, there you go. Brave new world. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So there you go. And by the way, I love the stuff in space. It shows you the uh, the orbit of everything, and you can click on different ones and see where it came from. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty, uh, yeah, pretty, uh, it's pretty neat. So, okay, now back to the show notes. Uh, we have time <laughs> to go ahead and get into story number three. Uh, yes. Plenty of time and tiny robots. Uh, they can do amazing things. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Yes, and by the way, if you have the show notes, I know, of course, you do, and you can fire off that YouTube video. It's absolutely compelling. It, Here's sure. a story. comes from BGR.com, story by Mike Werner. Uh, the headline, These Tiny Robots Tackle Tasks in Groups Just Like Insects. Think of bees or ants that work together, right? And it just irresistible headline, irresistible concept. And when I saw the video, I said, ding, this is for me. And I wanted to share. So here's a bit of the story. And once again, to have the show notes and see the picture and see the video really transforms this into a, an experience that makes it all come, come to life for you. A team of robotics researchers in Switzerland is experimenting with an army of pint-sized bots that can take on complicated tasks as a group. That's the fun part of this. The robots, called simply tribots, are tiny, foldable, flexible machines that think and move as a group, solving problems that normally take the power of a much larger robot. Wow. Each individual bot weighs a scant 10 grams, and they're capable of traversing a variety of terrain thanks to their ability to walk and even fling themselves over short distances. The flinging part in the video is comical and compelling at the same time. Mm -hmm. But what makes the tiny machine special is their ability to communicate with each other in a way that mimics insects. When the robots reach an obstacle, they can relay information to each other and work as a team to overcome it. As a team, the bots are assigned specific roles based on the needs of the group. Doesn't this sound like an ant colony? And it's so interesting to me. I, I hope you get a chance to see that video, everybody. It's just really compelling. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely have that up on the, on the video portion. And you know, you can see them do a variety of things <laughs> in the video, uh, even pushing a stack of paper, it looks like. Uh, they're flipping over gravel, uh, you know, hitting over uh, 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 divots and stuff like that. Very interesting. I, I mean, I've never... Uh, <sighs> So I've seen a lot of robots, and these are very simple as far as robots go. Um, yeah, very simple. I, I, I've, I don't know. I've never seen a robot really take advantage of springs like these do. They're very simple. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they're just kind of springs with, uh, with computer chips on them. Yeah, you know how some in nature some seed pods will, are, are, are designed to, when they burst apart, they have fling yeah. themselves and their contents. And so in a way, my mind thought about the combination of the ant colony and many individuals working as one mind, so to speak, and then the idea of in nature flinging or by just sort of flipping or, or skipping over things, just, it could be random, let's be honest, but I mean, it's just sort of intriguing to see scientists bring that into this robotics world, but bring it into a, a very small scale, many little bots, all thinking and working together as a team. Wow. <laughs> I love it. It's like, I don't know what sci-fi movie it is that had all the little um, robot spiders. That, that, I can't remember which film it is, but it's still uh, you know, terrifying. All these little cookie cutting spiders coming out, but they're all robots. I mean, I'm, sure, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sure something like The Matrix had that, I'm sure. Uh, One of those films, right? Yeah, and so yeah. here it is in reality, it's sort of not as scary. <laughs> well, but, yeah, and and I, I, you know, they kind of mentioned here later in the article, they kind of proposed that by instead of having just a couple crucial robots trying to accomplish a task, if you could have uh, swarms, as they said, mm -hmm, swarms mm -hmm. of robots, uh, if a few get damaged, if they get shorted out, if there's something wrong, it doesn't affect the whole mission. It, uh, you know, everything can, can go on exactly. as planned. Uh, the, the group is more important than any individual robot. Uh, I, I, just I, like I, ants. Yeah, just like ants. I'm trying to think where something like this would be immediately applicable. Um, man, am I having a hard time? Because, you know, we've seen a lot of robots when they're when they're larger and they're yeah. more capable of tra traversing tough terrain, the military's like, oh, we're going to need a million of those because we, know, we, know, we need those in combat zones to tow gear. Um, yeah. I'm having a hard time thinking about, like, these little tribots. Um, 
would you send like a swarm of them to like the moon and have them just crawl over the moon i guess i don't know maybe or you could equip them with uh, very miniaturized sensors of some kind to sense dangerous chemicals or to sense other things that That's interesting. And be deployed be deployed into difficultly difficult to access or difficult to maneuver terrain that would be difficult for a larger robot or a human or whatever or a vehicle to get to you could deploy these guys again you think about collapsed or uh, bombed out buildings god forbid but being able to get in and what if you could send a swarm of these little guys with sensors that might be able to sense uh, the presence of, uh, of uh, you know, a human being, yeah. right? And, yeah, and I, help. Yeah. It's another way. And it's conceptually very much related when you said swarm. I immediately thought of drone swarms, mm -hmm. right? And how it's this coordinated kind of thing. If you knock out one drone, well, it, it's, it'll sort of kind of self-heal with another drone. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, and and I definitely like the idea of, uh, of of collapsed buildings and things like that because obviously if you send uh, you know just like if you send a person in if you send a a person sized robot then there's the potential that the debris may fall and damage the robot and then the robot's useless. Uh, right. Not these things. You you would have dozens or hundreds more to, uh, to take its place. So what if you had thousands of them and you just open up the box and they just start going in and yeah maybe <laughs> maybe half of them get destroyed. But you, just, but it's like ants. You're just overwhelming it with a swarm. Yeah, very Something true. To think about. Very, very interesting. And and and, and you're yeah. right. The 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 actual locomotion of these things is uh, surprising. It's a hoot. For it's a hoot. yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely for sure. Uh, oh, okay, so we have uh, we have some time to get into the next story, which is perfect. Uh, story number four. If we run against the the break, I'll go ahead and interrupt you. But, you got it. Um, I love and get. I love and gadget. I love Mario Lemon. Uh, yes. Story number four. Yeah, story number four, again, a gadget, uh, Mariella Moon. Story headline, Samsung may, may develop foldable augmented reality glasses. So we have all know what happened with Google and the Google Glass and just kind of never really took off. And so Samsung, however, is not giving up on the idea and they are on a path to potentially develop this. So it says here, Samsung is exploring the possibility, so it's not a commitment, of developing augmented reality glasses based on a recent patent application. Once again, friends, you want to see where the bleeding edge is? Look at patents. Mm -hmm. Patents are uh, uh, binoculars into the future, right? The patent documentation show a foldable device that looks more like a typical pair of glasses with much thicker frames to accommodate its electronic components. The current design is an eyepiece that automatically switches on whenever it's unfolded. That's cool. When in use, the glasses projector mounted on the temple of the frame would beam images on the small display placed over the wearer's field of view. As, a, uh, as this is just a patent filing, the product may or may not come to market, but the continued interest in finding a wearable computer enhanced vision solution is evidenced by this move on Samsung's part. Mm -hmm. So I, I love the story. And again, if you have the show notes, you can see the illustration. Yeah, it's uh very and 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 honestly, as I, I know, I know that you just said that uh, Google Glass has never really caught on, but uh, to an extent, they did. Um, I, I know that uh, of all people, Epson because they have a oh, pretty okay. robust uh, uh, projector uh, mm -hmm. business as well. You know, they're right, not just, they're course, not just yeah. scanners or fa faxing or whatever. Right. Um, this technology is very similar to projectors and they are able or an Epson has them. Google has them. Uh, and a lot of companies are looking to get into this for, uh, b uh large business and enterprise yeah. solutions because sure. they, they love it for uh, warehouse workers. They love it for, uh, people who just have to work with, with a lot of documentation to be able to look at something with, you know, that would have like a QR code that these glasses could scan and then give information to the worker, uh, they're actually finding a, a surprisingly good niche. Uh, oh yeah, and I'll tell right you, there. Ben, one of the most promising, in my opinion, applications for this kind of technology, a wearable augmented reality vision, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, device, is in construction. I believe and it. I, I knew this from my time with Autodesk working in the architecture, engineering, construction division of Autodesk, that there were a lot of people developing these um, smart glasses for construction workers. So imagine a construction wor worker walks onto a building that's maybe in the very bare bones stage, but through augmented reality can move his or her head around and see where components like piping and walls and stuff will eventually go and double check things and be able to virtually 
build the structure in front of them and double check things through augmented reality. So in construction, it's being taken very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And when we come back, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about this and then wrap it up. And then we're going to go ahead and move on to our next story. But Ralph, there's music playing softly in the background. Everyone, we will be right back. More Computer America, more Ralph Bond, more, com well, hey, more computer technology news and science and tech trends. Everyone stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low cost airlines. With one call to low cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airline travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. Eight hundred two one five four four six one. That's eight hundred two one five forty four sixty one. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And everyone, hey, welcome back into the program. Uh, yeah, we continue on with Ralph Bond. We uh, we are doing science and tech trends. We have tons of great stories. I wanted to get a comment or two in left on, or a, an additional comment or two on this story before we moved on to our next story, but uh, which will be story number five. But uh, yeah, so everyone, uh, by the way, if you missed any part of our show so far, any articles, anything like that, show notes, of course, but but we also make the show available via podcast anywhere where you listen to podcasts. If you can't listen to us live on IRN, we definitely appreciate it. Go out and check out wherever you listen to podcasts and uh, search Computer America. We should pop right up today's show, yesterday's show, and every future show as well. Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and bring him back on. So, Ralph, thank you for continuing on with us. You got it. And I see that uh, I am getting, I'm being given directions by a, a higher... Uh, by a higher up here at Computer America, Craig in the chat room <laughs> wanted me to mention vehemently that uh, you know we were looking for robots that swarmed. Uh, yes. Looks like Ralph or looks like Craig dug through his memory and he found nice. none other than Runaway, 1984, Michael uh, Christian and Tom Selleck, and oh, wow. yeah, I guess that's an example cool. of one of those movies of uh, yeah. Tons of robots. Oh, that's great. So, oh, that's go. fun. I always love that kind of trivia. By the way, talk about movie trivia. Mm -hmm. uh, last night, my uh, wife and our, some of our friends uh, watched the Lego movie part two. Yeah. Oh, God, it's loaded with jokes. And in it goes right over the heads of the little kids. All this stuff about movies. It's sort of a goof on Star Wars, on Mad Max, Bended Films, all the sort of things. It was all mushed together with these very tongue-in-cheek things. It's a really cute film. If you liked the first Lego movie, I, I think I, you'll really like Lego, too. It was, it's a kick. 
I have heard that the Lego one and Lego two. I, I mean, when it comes to voice acting and just yes. the jokes, I mean, it's uh, endless it, jokes. Yeah, they're really good movies. They're definitely good. <laughs> movies. So, yep, yeah, definitely there. Okay, so getting back to right. our article at hand, story number four, <laughs> or we were talking about these augmented reality glasses, and I guess the difference here, uh, other than you know, we mentioned Google Glass and things like that, uh, the one from uh, from Epson. The the difference here would be the you know the fact that they're foldable, and by foldable that means more in the nature of uh, you know traditional glasses, reading glasses, that kind of thing. Uh, the legs would fold in, and then when they fold mm-hmm. out, it would then activate the uh, it would then activate right. the projector, and you'd be able to do everything. Yeah, smart um, design. Yeah, definitely, definitely a different kind of design, but uh, you know a very intuitive design to make them more like mm-hmm. regular glasses. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean. I don't know. This hasn't caught on again in the consumer world uh, for a lot of reasons. I think right. one of the primary ones being that people just aren't comfortable with cameras, you know, so apparent they have to be hidden. They have to be hidden, you know, in security cameras and things like that. Uh, right. But on people's faces, it's a step too far. Uh, but again, in the commercial world and like you said, in, in, in the construction world, uh, yep. these are these are getting some uh, some second attention. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're they're coming. And, and by the way, another one was uh, I can't I can't believe I forgot this. Another industry that is definitely using them uh, is uh, the shipping world. You know, when you, okay. when, when sure. workers are able to just look at a package and it scans it with the glasses and it can say where it's going, where it needs to go, that kind of thing. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, just streamlines the whole effect. So. That's cool. That makes sense. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so that's story number four. Let's go ahead and continue on. Story number five. Yes, this is a fun one. This is from Mashable.com is where I found the story. Actually, they in turn picked up the story from Tech News Daily, an article by Jillian Scar. Mm -hmm. Headline, a new high-tech way to detect crime scene fingerprints. Right? I mean, we're all... Very, very familiar with the classic dusting of fingerprints when the technicians go into a crime scene that's very familiar, right? And what they're doing is looking for latent fingerprints or deposits of secreted sweat and natural oils transmitted by touch onto a flat surface, which are usually invisible to the naked eye, usually, unless it's maybe around a clear glass or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But, But this is something I didn't know and this article points out. Experts say that only 10% of latent fingerprint images drawn from crime scenes are complete enough to be used in court. Only 10%. Wow. That really shows you the, the challenge and the, the motivation here. So to help improve fingerprint detection, a team of researchers at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom have developed a fluorescent tag approach. Hmm. This is pretty interesting. It says this new technology can help identify fingerprints on bullets and knives and other metal surfaces by creating images that are accurate to the nanoscale. Wow. Now, here we go into the geek out part of this. The new method for imaging latent fingerprints uses a film made of electroactive polymers, long, complex molecules that change shape in response to surrounding electric currents. Hmm. Due to the polymer's electroactive properties, this film can be applied via an electric current, which drastically reduces the risk of damaging the fingerprint before an accurate image can be drawn. So I suspect what they're saying is maybe the traditional uh, puffing of the, the dust on the fingerprints and other things may not um, be as conducive to preserving the fingerprints as this new technique. I think that's what they're trying to say. Goes right. on to say, when the electric current is directed at a latent fingerprint, the film adheres to the gaps between the swirls of deposits that comprise latent fingerprints, and not to the deposits themselves. So, between the gaps between the swirls of the deposits that comprise the latent fingerprints, and not to the deposits themselves. That's a key thing. That's why I wanted to repeat it. The polymers that comprise excuse me, the polymers that comprise the film are also, you'll love this, Ben, electrochromic. That is, when exposed to an electrical charge, they change color. Drum roll, here comes the result. The result is an inverted image, or negative, 
of the fingerprint that is highly detailed and visible, making it easy to photograph and analyze. And again, earlier, making the point that it's a much less, um, what would be the word, invasive technique in mm -hmm. terms of preserving the fingerprint as much as possible. So big, big jump maybe in forensics here for crime scenes. Kind of cool. Yeah. I, I, it, it, <laughs> it always seemed like a very traditional piece of police work to dust for fingerprints. Yes, yes. Um, I'm glad that it's getting a, a second look at with uh, traditional tactics mixing with current technology. Um, looks yeah. like it's, it's still being used. And, and by the way, I did like that they threw in that statistic about uh, only 10% of uh, fingerprints or at least latent fingerprints are able to be even used in court because, hey, you know, if, uh, if you have a part of a fingerprint, um, that may not be enough to truly identify someone. And I, right. you know, while, while you were doing this article, I had to Google fingerprints to see if they were actually unique. And uh, turns out the, the overall impression of a fingerprint is actually pretty unique. You know, uh, the swirls, the ridges, where they end, where they start, that Isn't kind of that thing. Something? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, it's mind blowing. Yeah, I, I always <laughs> figure that, you know, no way can everyone's fingerprint really be that unique, but, uh, but it's true. So, uh, electroactive polymers. There you go. I, very, very cool. cool. Very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, story number six. And by the way, we are about five stories in. You have selected 13 <laughs> of the best stories that we could possibly get. Well, and it's homework. We it's are homework. only, uh, yeah, only 40 minutes into the show. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm not going to ask you to, you know, let's go back to our traditional two hour show. But no, <laughs> story number six. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and keep it moving. Yeah. This is a really fun story. So it comes from CNN. And uh, the headline is Irish Teenager may have solution for, and I inserted, microplastic-free ocean, because the headline said plastic-free ocean, which was unintentionally misleading. So mm -hmm. we're talking about microplastics, not the big, you know, uh, plastic rings that top your six-pack that you, know, you pull off, or, or trash bags. Or, no, no, no. We're talking about microplastics. But, okay? but in, 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 by the way, and just real quick, uh, microplastics, though, I will say, before you, before we get started, uh, yeah. they're probably the bigger problem than, than the six-pack rings. Uh, microplastics they're are... They're insidious. Yeah, yeah they're, they're insidious. You're right. It's a huge problem. So go ahead. Yeah, and then there's a great YouTube video in the show notes. You can fire that off and, and check this out. So sure. here's the story. And, and bear with me. It's a little bit geeky, but uh, we'll get into this. I just love the fact. Here's a young man. Uh, that did this. Anyway, a teenager from Ireland may may have found a way to rescue our oceans from the growing microplastic pollution problem. Well, first, what are microplastics? Microplastics are pieces of plastic that are typically less than five millimeters long. So that would be, I think, about 0 0.19 inches. Uh, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the agency says Plastic is the most common type of marine debris found in our oceans and major lakes. Well, I think we all kind of know that. But here's something interesting. Even in smaller pieces, microplastics are used as an exfoliator in face wash, body scrubs, and toothpaste? Wow. And then this next bullet from the article, this just made me stop in my tracks. Americans eat, drink, and breathe between 74,000 and 121,000 microplastic particles each year. Yep. Wow. Wow. Isn't that freaky? Mm. Now, a walk on a beach led this Irish teenager, his name is Fionn Fiora, I hope I'm not butchering that, to develop his project on microplastic extraction from water for the annual Google Science Fair. And the project that he did get, captured a $50,000 educational scholarship uh, award. Wow. Pretty cool. Now, the challenge. Since we're talking about microplastics, this shouldn't be a surprise. Because of the tiny size of these microplastics, they're able to pass through water filtration systems that ultimate, and ultimately to go on to harm marine life and damage our oceans and major lakes. Now, here's the, here's the technology part of this. It's so ingenious and so, in a way, simple. In the presence of water, ferrofluids, which are non-toxic, magnetic liquids made up of oil and magnetite, an iron-based rock mineral, mm -hmm. attract the microplastics because both have similar properties. For his project, Fiera added oil and magnetite to water and mixed in a solution emulating plastic, microplastic waste in the ocean. When the microplastics latched onto the ferro 
fluids, Fiera dipped a magnet into the solution three times to remove both substances, leaving clear water. Now, this kid did more than 950 tests, and the method showed 88% effective in removing a variety of microplastics from water. So, is it the answer to life? No. Is it a step in the right direction? You bet. And salute to this teenager for figuring this out. Genius. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, we just finished watching the, the whole video right here, and uh, it, it, it's interesting because... Uh, being able to filter that kind of water, I'm sure that it's very, uh, very, very difficult. Like, I'm sure that we have filters nowadays that are so many microns, uh, you know, tight that you could probably filter it out the traditional way. But uh, trust me, I know this from my from another job that um, forcing liquid through very, very small micron filters uh, takes a lot of energy to push that fluid through those filters this is very cool because it just it mixes the like they said the magnetite in the in the ferrofluids it mixes them together and all you have to do is just get a nice strong electromagnet which are mm -hmm. uh, relatively easy to come by you know they're pretty easy to make uh, and then you just suck out all the plastic um, 88 percent effective like you said it's not the uh, it's not the cure-all that we all hope for but that's a darn good that's a good amount impressive that's very darn impressive. impressive i'd rather have 88 percent of the darn, darn stuff out of our water than none yeah, and, and and then of course look at uh, you know look at a way of getting the last 10, 12 percent out of there. Uh, yeah. Very interesting though, and I'm glad that uh, you know to to hear how he was inspired to do this, to go to the beach and say you know there there's a problem here, and to then make that his science experiment is yeah. you know a a real life problem, not you know not yes. not, not 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 the bad science experience that I did when you know which battery <laughs> lasts longer, how how high do different brands of golf balls potato bounce. battery, potato <laughs> batteries, you know, actually solving a pro or seeing a problem and actually you know at, yeah. at least looking into it, uh, very very cool. Yeah, very cool indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, there you go, story number seven, and here we go. Yes. So we're gonna go ahead and story number seven, uh, Pentagon. Always fun talking about them, and yes. And, and, and by the way, you know, uh, speaking of Craig, uh, we just took him to a doctor's appointment for his neck. Uh, you know mm. that whole thing yesterday, uh, which is by the way why we didn't have a live show yesterday. Uh, personal appointments, mm. but mm. Um, one of the treatments, and I don't know, uh, he he said it didn't work. Um, this is a this is about military's application of lasers. But for anyone out there who's going to the chiropractor or going anywhere for their mm -hmm. neck, um, mm -hmm. they might offer you a laser treatment for your neck. Huh. Um, he said he didn't like it. I think it's supposed to warm up the tissue around your neck like very uh, precisely. Oh, I and, see. Okay. And it's supposed to loosen up targeted. the muscles. Yeah, it's very targeted heat, uh, more so than you know a warm water bottle or something like that. I so. See that. Yeah, lasers are coming into our everyday lives, but the Pentagon, I'm sure, has better uses for them. So let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as preface to this story, we need to have in our mind the famous theme song from Twilight Zone. Just this, this is just weird science. This the Pentagon. Their last month, we talked about them using lasers to uh, detect or identify someone because of their unique heartbeat register. Right? Remember that story from last month. Well, right. here they go again with lasers. Pentagon tests talking lasers, talking lasers that could transmit speech hundreds of miles and will be ready for military use in five years. Now, that headline is, is forward thinking. They're not there yet by any stretch. Uh, pick this up, of all places, the UK's Daily Mail, story by Ian Randall. So here's the scoop. And again, I just mentioned we talked about uh, last month and the uh, laser Rob, picking and, up the uh, heart. Right, and, and, and Ralph, just real quick, let me let me know if you hear yeah. this. You hear it playing in the background a little bit? I do not, unfortunately. But uh, if it's the Twilight Zone theme it, song, I it, it is. It. is so, so, I'm, so I'm betting everyone out there can hear it. Yes, it is the Twilight Zone theme song. But go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. Very appropriate. So here we go. Here's the story: uh, the laser-induced plasmic effect. Laser-induced plasmic effect program is part of the U.S. Department of Defense effort to develop new methods to ward off, stun, or stop the actions of targeted individuals without killing them. So it's not meant to be, you know, lethal. Non-lethal, the right. Yeah. The laser device works by sending a beam of high-energy laser light in short pulses 
to strip the electrons from atoms of air in its path to create a plasma. Okay, this is getting really weird, but there's more. Using a second laser tuned to the right frequencies, researchers are then able to vibrate the plasma to create sound waves. Could be anything from unearthly shrieks to clear snippets of speech. Wow. Now, here's the reality check on where they are today. Researchers are confident that the laser will soon be able to cross distances of about 330 feet, and then eventually, eventually, on to distances of multiple or even hundreds of miles. Now, what would they do with this thing? Well, it could, there's some of the suggestions from the article. It could be used to communicate with distant crowds or military groups or platoon or something, right? Or warn intruders away from a military a perimeter, think of Area 51, right? Mm -hmm. Or even beam orders to the ground from an aircraft. That's an interesting thought. Now, reality check. The only limitation of this laser and this idea is that it would not be able to travel through solid barriers, although it can pass through glass windows into buildings. So, freaky and weird, hence the uh, Twilight Zone music request. Mm -hmm. But, but intriguing and interesting and really makes you stop and think about <laughs> Right. It, it, you, you would need a clear line of sight uh, for this technology to work. And I got to say that uh, non-lethal options, I get it. Uh, there are more and there's more civil unrest lately. It seems, you know, uh, of course, uh, what's happening out in Hong Kong. Uh, there yes, there oh are boy. protests all over the world in a lot of different places. I know that there are some in Russia and China. Um and of course the yeah. u.s uh and being able to i guess disperse the crowds when things get a little too hectic uh also i'm thinking south america but still being able to disperse the crowds uh, ralph have you heard about some of the other you know kind of non-lethal methods that they have nowadays you know i can't think of some off the top of my head so one, here, one so, little, yeah go ahead yeah so 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 let me uh you know walk you through like a couple that i can think of yeah back yeah. in back in the day and i'm thinking uh civil rights period that kind of thing Mm -hmm. uh, you know, crowd dispersion included dogs and uh, riot uh, riot police and water cannons, right? Yep. Uh, you know, things like that. Nowadays, you have things like uh, tear gas, pepper spray. You have, uh, of course, still the, the riot police. Uh, but they also have uh, some things. And one that's actually almost labeled inhumane, uh, mm. it's a giant microwave on a truck. Huh. And they can actually pointed at an individual or group of individuals and as soon as they flip the switch it feels like your skin is on fire um yes and, and of course as soon as you move out of the beam or they turn the beam off uh everything stops like it you're you're perfectly fine you're okay again i'm sure that prolonged exposure will cause uh damage but just short burst is just very irritating but not lethal um yeah yeah that seems and, and to be the thing Oh, yeah. And then, by the way, if you dig deep into this article, because I just grabbed the highlights, right, of course. Uh, it mentions in passing, it mentions in passing that this exact same technology we were just talking about, this laser induced plasma effect could be used to heat up, to warm, unpleasantly warm yeah. a target crowd to your point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's but it's not going to kill you. It's just going to make you feel. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I'm, not I'm comfortable. And like I said, uh, probably prolonged <laughs> exposure. But uh, these kinds of things are not about um, the like the article said. They're not about killing anyone. They're not about uh, you know causing any kind of long term damage. It's about you know what happens when a group, a crowd of people, like hundreds or thousands strong, suddenly work themselves up into a frenzy for you know whatever cause it may be. Uh, being able to disperse that crowd without actually having to take drastic actions, uh, that's very interesting for, uh, yeah, I, I can see, is. with the Pentagon. Uh, There's so, a lot of good and bad possibilities here. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I'll, although, personally, uh, even though it's still a weapon, it's a non-lethal weapon, and that's yeah. probably a step in the right direction. There you uh, go. Yep, and hey, and if you really want to avoid it, all you have to do is bring a raincoat or something, uh, because it, it needs is. a clear line of sight. So, uh, there you go. Story number eight. And then I'm going to go ahead and look for the last story that we'll do, but we'll do story number eight and then one. Yeah. More. Yeah. We may have time here to well, certainly do story number eight, maybe even a little bit of one more, but here we go. Story number eight from CNET story by Eric Mack. Scientists create a fabric that smells better. The more you sweat, <laughs> your gross workout gear could double as an air freshener. I'd put that to the test. 
Yes, me too. <laughs> Working out in the yard. Anyway, a team of engineers from a university in Portugal have developed two ways to modify cotton fabric so that it lets off a citronella aroma when it comes into contact with sweat. So there's two ways they've done this. Method number one, you'll love this, it's hilarious. Method one, the scientists used a protein found in pig's noses that binds to scent molecules. They also attached what's known as carbohydrate binding module, which binds to the cotton fabric. Method number two, they used fat-like liposomes rather than proteins to bind the pleasant scent to the fabric. Now, they tweaked the cottons uh, to release the citronella scent when they came in contact with an acidic sweat solution. Mm. The pig nose protein treated fabric emitted a quick burst of lovely centronella, while the liposomes cleared the air with a slower, more controlled release. As a bonus, we all know citronella is also a popular insect repellent, right? right? So it ends with this kind of tongue-in-cheek thing. Keeping both mosquitoes and bad body odor away could be soon be as simple as reeling off 50 quick jumping jacks. <laughs> but I so, thought, wow, this is really something. <laughs> so, and, and the, on, the only problem I have with this is that obviously uh, it's not going to be a never-ending supply of citronella. Um, I'm wondering if you like if you could possibly uh, regenerate this with like uh, special uh, I'm sorry special That's fabric sheets or something like yeah. that or if you yeah. have like replaceable parts uh, I wonder how that would work yeah you're right is it a one-off thing or is it something that's permanent and if so how could it possibly be? yeah you make a good point because you're gonna launder these clothes yeah so then what yeah, you I, make a pretty good point. I would hope that you'd be able to replenish them, and it's not just a, a one-time parlor trick. It's um, you know, it's something that you could you know, it's like, hey, let's uh, let's refresh our workout gear, and you do this to it. Uh, pig snouts. Ew. Now, uh, with that being said, we just did story number eight. Uh, I, I really want to get this last story in just real quick, if we can. Story number ten. Uh, we would like to yeah. skip down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, go. Everyone, please go check out oh, story yeah. 9, uh, 9, 11, 12, 13. But story number 10 really caught my attention. Yeah, me too. From The Verge, a uh, story by James Vincent. The last mile delivery startup, a last mile delivery startup, wants to put robots in bike lanes. So the real nut of this story, and you can see in the show notes, and there's a video of this cute little uh, tricycle-like device. It's, it's a really kind of cute looking thing. Uh, kind the, of like a the baby main carrier. Deal, yeah. Oh, well, like a baby carriage. Yeah, that's a really good... Uh, yeah. Point. So it says here, a whole host of startups have launched in recent years with the aim of making last mile deliveries using robots. No surprise, right? But a company in Michigan has a new spin on this. It wants to put them in bike lanes, which is very controversial in a way. The company is called Refraction AI, and it recently announced this little boat, bot called Rev or REV-1. I'll call it Rev-1. Mm -hmm. And the company's founder says it's sort of like the Goldilocks solution of the last mile delivery robots, neither too big nor too small. And it's the Rev1 is larger than most delivery robots, but it's which are about the size of coolers, but it's smaller and less expensive than autonomous vehicle vans or shuttles that you might come to mind of other stories we've done in the past and we've seen this well elsewhere. So the here's something that's interesting. The robot is lightweight and low power enough to qualify under e-bike regulations. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that means it can go in the bike lane, right? Uh, the platform is lightweight, nimble, and fast enough to operate in the bike lane and on a roadway. Now, the unit will cost about $5,000. The Rev1 will also be more affordable than bigger rivals while still offering enough space to carry four packed grocery bags of shopping. You know, I, I have so many mixed feelings about this whole idea of clogging our, our roadways and our sidewalks with uh, scooters now and these delivery bots and then drones flying overhead coming to the house and all this stuff sometimes i think wow i have enough trouble just driving down the street without killing myself or others let alone having all this other stuff going on so i have mixed feelings about this well right and 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 really uh and, and by the way for anyone out there watching the video portion we're playing the video it's uh it, it's kind of cute you know they have it rolling yeah, through a uh that they, they have it rolling through a neighborhood and you know essentially avoiding pedestrians and waiting for cars and things like that. Um, Ralph, you are looking at, or what you just described is a side effect of kind of Amazon and having everything delivered yes. to our door, uh, packages, yes. food, groceries, and more. Um, it has, you know, if everyone wants the convenience, uh, something has to give and maybe it's going to have to be the bike lanes. Um, 
<laughs> yes. And I don't know about your, where you live, but in Portland area, bicyclists are very aggressive, militant characters. It's sort of like <laughs> the episode on Portlandia when Fred Armisen does his mm-hmm. character, uh, the bicyclist, he's angry. And these guys are militant. So I don't know how this is going to work out. Yeah. And a friend of mine, a friend of mine, by the way, looked at this story and said, I'm sorry, in a kind of Mad Max dystopian world view, homeless people might attack these vehicles to get to the food out of desperation. That's, so, I mean, there's all kinds yeah. of things you could kind of say, ooh, you know, there's possible problems here. Yeah, uh, we we just talked about that with one of our other correspondents on Wednesday, and they were talking about uh, delivery drones, and yeah. you know, uh, because they're still pushing for that. And it's like, well, and he said where he lives, there's there's a lot of rednecks. Uh, what happens if they want to go duck hunting and take Teach out a couple you. packages exactly, and uh, and see what they get? You know, it's like a little slot machine that you shoot down. Uh, you never know. But hey, Ralph, we're flat out of time. If people want to find out more, where can they go? Super easy. Point your browser to Ralph bond and then the word wix w-i-x that'll take you right to the link to my website and all the contents there for you to check out all right perfect and of course we'll have a link in the show notes ralph until next month thank you so much everyone else out there thank you thank thank you have a great weekend do something fun check us back here monday 4 p.m to 5 p.m eastern bye everyone